Hallelujah. The Lord has a word for us this morning out of the book of Luke. This morning I have preached over the last 45 years. Easter messages from every kind of direction, from all the four Gospels, <laughs> uh, many, many times. But this morning, a message that just simply because he lives. You realize because the Lord lives this morning. Uh, <laughs> how many of you wouldn't be here this morning if he, if he wasn't alive? <laughs> you wouldn't be alive this morning. Uh, thank the Lord that he is alive this morning. Uh, and he loves you. Amen. Uh, with all of our warts and faults and all, he still loves us this morning. If you have your Bible, chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, uh, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, uh, there about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember, he spake unto you when he was and yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his word. Father, thank you this morning. Your word is life to us today. It's our road map and our journey of life on the face of this earth. Your word is true this morning. It's very relevant for the day in which we live. And I simply ask this morning, would you impart to us that which you'd have for us out of these scriptures a message this morning that because you live uh, because you live we can live also we can have life more abundantly uh, we are blessed this morning because uh, we have a heavenly father with an advocate uh, lord this morning make an intercession for us uh, and i simply ask that you'd bless uh, our time together in the house of the lord let, Father, every need uh, spiritually be met in this place today. And we'll thank you for it. We ask that divine anointing this morning of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, Easter Sunday morning, Christianity. Uh, amen. Uh, uh, is the greatest moment, uh, this thing called the resurrection. Uh, the greatest moment for Christians this morning is the greatest message that we have. The concept of resurrection, resurrection this morning lies at the heart of, of the message of, of Christ this morning, of our faith. Uh, uh, you remove it, Christianity is nothing. Uh, it has no meaning, it has no purpose, uh, it's in vain, uh, it's destroyed. Uh, it's the central fact of all Christian faith this morning in history is this thing called the resurrection, which uh, we're celebrating this morning. The whole message of the angels uh, uh, rests, oh, the whole message of the gospel rests on the fact of the resurrection. Everything hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead this morning. Had he not come out of that grove, grave this morning, you and I wouldn't have the message we have today. Uh, the, apostle, the apostles were sent out to share the witness of that message. The whole book of Acts uh, uh, emphasizes the resurrection. Uh, uh, it, it's a powerful message this morning. John, the 14th chapter, verse 9, said, Jesus said, Because I live, you shall live also. It's the greatest message the church has to preach. Uh, the reason the message is so powerful this morning is Jesus conquered Del, hell, death, hell, and the grave. Uh, it defeated this morning. In other words, uh, Jesus has power over life and death. Uh, your life is in his hands this morning. Uh, every day that you and I live is a gift from God. Uh, we have graciously ordered another day, uh, uh, wonderfully blessed uh, to have that life. Uh, but the message here this morning is that there was nothing that could keep Jesus down. <laughs> nothing could keep him down. Uh, uh, even the Jewish uh, religion of that day that was down off track, uh, uh, they could not keep him down. The Roman Empire who was occupying uh, 
Judea and all of Jerusalem uh, uh, had authority over the Jews. Uh, couldn't keep him down. Uh, uh, nothing could keep him down. Even the disciples' faith, who now faith, uh, faltered and wavered uh, in many different ways, uh, couldn't keep him down. The reason is God's power this morning uh, to raise Jesus from the dead is greater than all the power that's on the face of this earth, greater than all the nuclear plants, greater than all the armies that ever march, uh, greater this morning than all the adversaries and the clear, uh, critics, greater than all the atheists this morning uh, and the uh, demonic cults. But I'm going to tell you, it's even more than that. The power of God this morning is greater than your weaknesses your failures, your faults, your frailties, uh, greater this morning uh, than all of your brokenness, your hurts, uh, greater than all the despair and hopelessness that sometimes we go through, all the things of life that you and I face, God's power is greater than that. If I didn't believe that this morning, I would not walk into another hospital to pray for another person. I wouldn't go into another home uh, uh, that people are getting ready to leave this world if I didn't have the belief that God is who he is, has all power and authority in our lives to take us through what nobody else can take us through. Because he lives this morning, first of all, life is worth living no matter what the circumstances. Get down your spirit this morning. Don't care how discouraged sometimes you get. Don't care where things are. Life is worth living this morning because he lives. No matter what the circumstances you're dealing with or going through, Jesus gives us life. He gives us meaning. He gives us purpose. He gives us value. Nobody gives you value like God can give you value. Nobody can put a purpose in your life like he can put a purpose in your life. Nobody can give you meaning like he can give you meaning with him. Life this morning has worth. Life this morning makes sense. You show me a person this morning uh, that can make sense out of life in the situation where he's at. I'll show you one who's not compli uh, complicating his life with suicide and all the other things. Uh, I'll show you a person this morning that can live and, and go through things that most people would fall from. But to have life in him this morning means life makes sense uh, because it ties us to another world. Our relationship with the Lord ties us to another world, that unseen world this morning, uh, that unseen world, but just as real as the one we're living in this morning, it ties us to that. John the 14th chapter said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. So we're not so I would tell you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Many times we pray for revival. The hope of America this morning hinges on a revival. There's no other thing that can help our country this morning than an old-fashioned revival where hearts are changed, lives are touched, people uh, are transformed. Uh, we need revival. But revival this morning, we don't pray for revival for the church uh, because the church to be blessed because the church is already blessed. We pray for revival that the church would get out to those uh, who need the message this morning that he's still alive and they can have hope. Uh, that's why we pray for revival this morning, to tell people that life is worth living. Uh, there is hope this morning that Easter, if it's about anything, it's about giving new life uh, and a new future, all made possible through the resurrection of Jesus. How many this morning have found new life? Uh, in a new future in him. Some of you can remember where you've come from. Uh, you can remember before the cross. Uh, you can remember before you got saved. You can remember before you got, uh, came into church membership. Uh, uh, you can remember those days when there was another uh, uh, avenue that you was traveling. But when he came into your life, there's a new life, a new hope, a new direction, a new future. The second thing is this one, because he lives, not only is life worth living, but prayer has a point. Prayer has a point. Prayer is not in vain. Prayer is not to get God to do what we want him to do. Understand that. Prayer is not to get God to do what we 
we want him to do. Prayer is about uh, us coming in alignment with God, uh, finding his purpose for our lives and why we were created, why we're here, and what he's wanting to do with our lives. Uh, First Timothy, second chapter, verse 5 says, well, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. God is our prayer answering God. We have a Savior this morning who's a mediator, who's an advocate, who makes intercession for you and I on a daily basis. He's in a, praying for us. Uh, First Peter, the third chapter, verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord uh, are open, uh, and over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. In other words, this morning prayer is never in vain. Uh, how many of you here this morning because somebody's prayed for you? Maybe it was your mama, your grandmama, but somebody held you up in prayer, got a hold of the horns of the altar, believe God uh, for you, and you're here this morning because prayer began to saturate your life, uh, and the Lord began to get a hold of it. Uh, things changed. Even Jesus said uh, his father's house was to be a house of prayer. Prayer is the means by which you and I this morning uh, develop a deeper relationship with God. It's in those moments uh, that we're in prayer that God can speak in your life uh, uh, like no other time. Uh, it's amazing this morning, uh, uh, that believe it or not, that God, the creator of the universe, wants to have a relationship with you and wants to spend time with you and have companionship with you. Now, he's, he could be anywhere in the universe, do anything in the universe, but he wants to spend time time with you and I this morning. He wants that personal time. He wants that time that is set aside uh, that we can come uh, with our lives before him and he's speaking to our lives. Uh, it's a wonderful moment when God begins to deal with us uh, in that personal way and you know that you've heard from God. You know that you've got a word from God. You can take that word and you begin to run on it, walk on it, live on it, trust it. Uh, it makes a difference in your life. Uh, no matter where you're at, uh, you can always pray. I used to pray a lot when I was in school, especially getting ready to take a test. <laughs> Look at the ones in the Bible. Daniel prayed in the lion's den. I can tell you that's a good place to pray. I can't imagine Daniel in that lion's den and uh, you can imagine those lions just slobbering all over this. Uh, they, they saw him, but they couldn't touch him. Their mouths and jaws was locked. Uh, Daniel just said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. I, I, I see what you're doing. I'm watching them. I see what you're doing. Thank you, Lord. Praying in the lion's den. Samson praying, give me one more chance, Lord. He's blinded by the Philistines, but he says, Lord, give me one more chance. Uh, and the Bible said the Lord answered that prayer, and he had more victory in that one incident than all the others in all the battles he'd been in. God's a prayer answer God. Hezekiah on his deathbed. So God prayed and just turned to the Lord. Said, Lord, I, I've tried to live for you. I've tried to do things right. The Bible said God healed him and gave him 15 more years, added 15 more years unto his life. I'm talking about a prayer answering God this morning. I'm talking about one who knows you, knows what you need, knows where you're at, knows what's going on in your life. Uh, no matter where you are, you can always pray. The third thing this morning is because he lives, you can face tomorrow. God knows the future. <laughs> God knows the future. There's nothing you're going to do tomorrow that God doesn't already know about. Uh, there's no problem with God in guiding your steps and making directions for you because he's planned everything in advance. And because he's planned everything in advance, uh, there's no mistakes, there's no surprises, there's no recalls. Uh, uh, it's a life that you can trust. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not on thy own understanding. Uh, all of us should be concerned about the future because that's where we're going to spend the rest of our life, and eternity is in the future. And we're about... We're about we're worried sometimes about here and now. We're worried about this and that. Never thinking about the future. Never thinking about where things are in eternity. But God knows all that this morning. Uh, uh, we ought to be concerned about where we're going to spend uh, uh, the rest of our lives in, in eternity. That's why we need to be concerned about the future. Putting it in God's hands. Uh, it's a good reason to trust Proverbs, the third chapter, verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct the path. 
it's not a problem this morning not knowing where to go. The problem is we don't take time to talk to them about it. But the Bible says he shall direct all of our paths. Because he lives, our steps, the Bible said, are ordered of the Lord. He promises never leave us or forsake us. In other words, God never gives up on us. There's been times you've given up on yourself. There's been times you thought, oh, buddy, this is it. It's all over. But God never gave up on you. You're still here this morning. Uh, he never forsakes us, never leaves us, never gives up on us. He promises that in his presence is the fullness of joy. Now, it really doesn't get any better than that. When you find that God can answer that prayer, meet that need, and in his presence is full of, of joy, you can't get no better than that. The world can't give you that, and the world can't take away what he gives you. Because he lives this morning, it proves Jesus is deity. It verifies the truth of the scriptures. It's proof of our future inheritance. Uh, it assures, of, assures us of the, this one power of death, hell, and the grave. It gives us the blessed hope. Uh, I'm still old-fashioned enough to believe in the rapture of the church. Uh, I believe that one day the Lord's going to walk over, pull the lever on the rapture machine, and and his people are going up. <laughs> I don't hear much of that anymore. Uh, a lot of them don't believe that anymore, but it doesn't change the Bible. The Bible declares it. I believe it this morning. Trust the Lord. Uh, that's the blessed hope of the church this morning. Uh, because he lives, he can change us into a more gracious, loving, generous, patient, peaceful believer. How many of you would say this morning, Lord, change me. <laughs> change me, Lord, change me. All of us ought to be wanting to grow deeper and mature a little more in him all the time. You could take any one of those, say, I preach an hour on each one of those changes that they could do. But let me just touch one this morning because it's the one most important to him in the word. First John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, beloved of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8 said, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If the church could ever get to loving each other enough to let the world notice it make a difference around the neighborhood. Jesus thought that and said that and taught that in John the 13th chapter, verse 35, said, But this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love one for another. Christians aren't known this morning by the smile. They're not known this morning by the song. They're not known by the shout or how they serve. They're not known this morning by how big a Bible they carry. They're not known this morning by how loud they say amen. But real Christians are known by the way they love one another. They care about the needs of one another. They're looking out for one another. They're, 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 they're lifting up the burdens of one another because he lives this morning uh, you can look for him among the living. Now listen. Among those who are worshiping, following, serving the Lord, that's where you're going to find him. That's where you're going to find him. He's going to be with those this morning that are doing his work. And The angels asked the women at the grave, says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Have you ever wondered how many times people look for the Lord in all the dead places. I said a lot of times you 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 uh, think about those that are studying the Bible. A lot of times, just look at it as a historical document. And yet, the Word of God is more alive than the Mars newspaper. You'll find that in the Book of Ezekiel. I mean, it's as up to date as anything we've got on the news today. But a lot of people look at it as just a historical document. It's just a dead old historical document. They look sometimes as they come into the service and look like they're going to a memorial service. I want to tell you this, something this morning. He's alive. Uh, uh, he's here this morning. Uh, and let me tell you this this morning. Uh, Jesus is not only alive, but he's the head of the church. This is not Pastor Hardy's church. This is his church. You're his people. I'm just one of the small little clogs in the machinery of what's happening here. Very small little clog. 
in the machinery. It's his church. He's the head this morning. He's active and he's active in every service. Whether we realize it or not, feel it or not, or think it or not, he's active in every service. He's active in every altar call. There's signs of his presence of power all around us, among us. Uh, you look sometimes at those you see coming in, uh, you know that it's been the grace of God brought them in. It brought you in at one point in time. Uh, brought you in when you, nobody thought they'd ever see you in church, yet the power of God was working and bringing you in. If you're going through a dark place this morning, uh, and life doesn't seem to make sense, uh, right or wrong seems to have changed jersey and uh, jerseys and you know they don't know anymore what is right and what is wrong it seems like they got it all twisted up turned around in our day and time hold on keep on going remember his words uh, the two disciples on the Emmaus road at first missed the significance of one of the most historical historical moments they was on that road, and all of a sudden, they were walking along, talking about all the different disappointments and things that had taken place, and think, well, I don't understand why it had to happen like this. And they were just kind of in a, in, a, in, a, in a mess over, over what had taken place in Jerusalem and the crucifixion. Jesus is walking right beside them, <laughs> and they're so focused on the problem and the difficulties and things that they didn't even recognize him walking along beside him. How many times he comes in the church, sits down beside us, and we don't we don't really recognize him? Could be a different appearance and different things that sometimes people that God just uses in your life to touch you in different ways. Uh, uh, the, those on that Emmaus road, uh, not only were they missing the fact they would that Jesus was walking with it, they didn't see it. They was walking in the wrong direction. They was walking away from Jerusalem, leaving the fellowship of the brethren when they should have been there during this time, being encouraged and walking with those that are believers. Uh, fact is, we need to look sometimes for him and his presence in every aspect of our lives. Do you think that the Lord is just here on a Sunday morning with you? If he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, do you think he's, here just on a Sunday morning? No, he's, he'll, he'll go to the hospital with you. <laughs> he goes with you to work. He goes, he's with you. If you think all the time, the only time he's with you is at church, uh, you're missing a part of your life uh, with him that uh, uh, could be a great help to you and enjoy. Because he lives, uh, he'll find you. You don't have to look for him in a sense that... Uh, he can't be found. He can be found. He said, when you seek me with all of your heart, all your mind, soul, right, so, so, you can find me. He said, he'll come to you. Because he lives, we can have peace this morning. People everywhere this morning are looking for peace, looking for solution. The Pope's message this morning uh, was all about peace and settling the issues in this war and things that were going on around the world. People everywhere looking for peace. Some look for peace through artificial means. Uh, they never thought of a spiritual sense of a need, uh, but they begin to look for satisfaction and peace in food, alcohol, drugs, uh, money, material things, uh, things that they try to indulge and get uh, as much as they can of it to find some type of peace. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the list could go on this morning, but sooner or later, those things become inadequate. Those things become a spiritual bankruptcy. This morning, to all those things, uh, that you begin to see through them and that don't work anymore. Jesus said, peace be with you. Nobody could give you peace this morning like he can because he lives. He can give us peace this morning. Uh, you say, how can Jesus could he give peace? peace and say, I give you my peace in one of the most turbulent times he was going through. Simple because he was there. He was peace. He's the God of peace this morning. He's the Prince of Peace. Uh, when he's there, when he's in the mix, when he's in your place where you're at, there's a peace. It's the presence. It's in his presence we find a calm, a quiet assurance that he is, in fact, working all things to our good and for us. It's Romans 8, 28 all over again. 
that he's working on your behalf, working for your good. Uh, you see, everybody has Fridays when everything goes wrong, everything just blows up. Uh, yucky days, the dream's gone, the hope's crushed. You feel like giving up. Everybody has those days. But if you could just get a hold of the fact that Sunday's coming, that there's a resurrection, there's a time when the Lord's going to take care of all this uh, because he lives, sickness can't hold you forever. Because he lives, disappointment and divorce can't tie you down forever. Doubts and fears uh, can't hold you forever because he lives. Uh, life messages can't hold you forever. Those things that sometimes encumber us, baggage and things that we carry around that it's hard sometimes to deal with because he lives this morning. Those things don't have a hold on us. How many times you've asked the question, why can't I seem to do better? Why, why can't I seem to get it together? Why can't I sometimes get the victory? It looks like I wish I could get it down the road like brother so-and-so. So, so I wish I could be as good as they are. I wish I could have it all together like they do. Why can't I stand up for my faith like other people can? A thousand and one questions this morning. Sometimes we feel like we've made a miserable mess of our lives. Yet if Easter is anything this morning, it's a special message to those that feel like they've failed, they've lost the faith. But there's new hope, there's a new chance, there's a new place in Him that you can find the joy, the peace, the help, the strength that only He can give. Bill and Gloria Gaither, two of the most prolific, popular Southern gospel writers and performers in the entire world. Bill and Gaither... Bill and Gloria met while teaching high school together. And Bill had roots in the Southern gospel music and began to the Gaither, Bill Gaither trio with his brother Danny and his sister Mary Ann. Soon after Bill and Gloria met, uh, they began to share ideas about songs and a music ministry and those things. They married in 1962, and Bill was now devoting full-time uh, ministry to that of music and his music career. But the 60s were, and some of you have lived through those 60s, uh, kind of a chaotic era. And the quantum shift in values was deeply troubling and disturbing to Bill and Gloria. They began to wonder if God had given up on the world and especially America. The winter of 1969 in Indiana was particularly bleak for them. Not only had Indiana winter become long and a hard one, uh, the north wind began to blow more fierce and usual in that region than ever before. Bill had been stricken with a severe case of mononucleosis. For a singer, you know, that's, that's not a good thing when it attacks your vocal cords and all that. Uh, at the same time, Gloria and some of the other members of their church family encountered some of the most painful false accusations and belittlement anybody could go through. As you can imagine, this was a very difficult time, very difficult place for both Bill and Gloria. She remembers sitting in the living room in agony and fear on New Year's Eve. Because across the nation at that time, the educational system uh, was carrying the thing, God is dead. It was being promoted in all the schools, God is dead idea. The drug abuse had begun to rack up and some of the racial tensions began to spill over in all the areas. And it was about that time that Bill and Gloria discovered that they were getting ready to have a new baby, getting ready to have a son. It was a wonderful news, yet at the same time kind of uh, concerning to them because of the conditions of the way the world was. And it was really a thinking, was it a wise thing to bring a child into the world when the conditions are like it is? One Sunday day in the first of spring, uh, Bill and Gloria and Bill's father, George, was walking across the parking lot going to the little A-frame offices that they had. George stopped and said, come over here, Bill. You and Gloria, come over here. And they begin to point down to one blade of grass coming up through the concrete. That one little single blade of grass 
has pushed his way through the dirt, through the rocks, through the concrete, to get above all of it to the sunshine, one blade of grass. That one blade of grass, as he pointed it out to them, they begin to look at it. And <laughs> it had such a strong will to live. It had overcome all the odds to fulfill its destiny. That blade of grass began to be a symbol to the gaze of how God worked in his creation. It inspired glory to write a song, expressing the hope that shaped all the shape that was shaped by the resurrection of Jesus as well as that blade of grass and also uh, the birth of the Son. We've already sang it this morning, but I want you to listen to the word. For sometimes we sing songs in here, but we don't really get the impact of the words. Now, I want you to hear this song that Gloria wrote uh, that came out of a moment of desperation, came out of a moment of anxiety, came out of a moment uh, of not knowing what the future might be and, and concerning that little one, son, that, that she was getting ready to bring in her. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to live, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and the joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. I know who holds the future. And life is worth it just because he lives. I want you to know something.